Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 52, Medieval Rehearsal and Performance. Last time, the introduction of the new feast day of Corpus Christi proved to be the catalyst for drama to move out of the church and expand into epic, episodic play cycles that became popular very quickly. From the 14th century onwards, the plays developed and expanded until, in some places, they spanned across days either side of the festival, and structures around the production of the plays developed. The church retained a hand in the productions to ensure biblical authenticity, but producers, authors and actors began to have freedoms in the productions of the plays. We left off at the end of the last episode with questions about how productions were to be organised and financed being asked, and with each festival finding their own answers. Although the records are sparse and we can only assume that the few examples we have were similarly replicated across Europe, we have some idea of how the practicalities of the production of the play cycles was handled. Once the organisers of the festival had been put in position, and they could be any combination of municipal authority, religious leaders, trades guilds members or other local luminaries, the roles of the key people for the plays had to be defined and suitable people appointed. Producer, stage manager, master carpenter, a costume maker and someone to construct the special props and effects were all needed to one degree or another, depending on the scale of the plays being presented. In addition to these key figures, more casual labourers were also required to prepare the site, construct sets, to acquire and arrange seating, amongst many other tasks. The church choirs and musicians were also used, and it's assumed that the priests and other clerics took on the roles relating to preparing the scripts and the financials of the productions, as such people were already skilled in these matters. The actors were probably selected from within these groups, but also from local volunteers and, as the years passed, experience also came to be an asset. Given that Corpus Christi falls sometime in late May to early June, depending on the date of Easter, for the larger festivals preparations could begin as soon as the end of the Easter ceremonies would allow. For those involved this was a serious commitment, but one that people seemed happy to bear. The plays were produced for some 300 years or so and remained popular and essentially amateur productions throughout that time, driven by the enthusiasm of the production teams. We can only assume that such enthusiasm was reciprocated by the local community and it is that that kept the productions alive year after year. It seems that the plays had a unifying effect on the community and were probably the one occasion of the year when the whole local community gathered together largely without regard to rank or status. There is some very slight evidence from various places of disagreements and arguments between the organisers over specific matters and actors feeling underappreciated. But these are very few and far between, suggesting that in general the productions were harmonious and for the Corpus Christi period at least local rivalries and personal opinions were put to one side. The church must have been very pleased with that effect. The placing of the festival sometime in the month following late May meant that it avoided the hardest rigours of the summer harvest gathering, an operation that called on the full manpower of the village or town, but also left it susceptible to the vagaries of the European climate. There were several records of plays being postponed due to bad weather. Despite this, there are no records of attempts to bring the plays indoors. That's probably because the requirement to attract a large crowd, the whole local community, wherever possible, was a paramount consideration, and that dictated an outdoor setting. As I mentioned last time, the location to be used was decided on a festival-by-festival basis, and the size of the audience area and the ease of access for a large crowd seems to have been the main concern. Where natural features like natural amphitheatres or flat open spaces existed, they were used but the courtyards of abbeys were also used, as were multiple locations, creating a sort of travelling show where this made sense locally. In Chester, for example, the plays were performed outside the gates of the abbey and then moved to the front of the town hall. The action sometimes continued as the company moved in procession from one site to another. A telling direction from the Coventry plays states that Herod rages in the pageant and also in the street. So the layout and size of the playing space and the audience-to-actor relationship very much depended on the location and facilities available. As I've said, at every place, for every cycle, that setup varied, 
but we can identify three broad types into which most would fit. It's difficult to say which was more common, so in no particular order we have the round, the marketplace and the wagon. The round was created in an open space at some convenient spot. The circular space was marked out and then either scaffolds were built to form the circle or, where the soil allowed, the centre was dug out and the soil used to form an outer ring. That earthen bank, or the scaffolds or combination of the two, could then accommodate the audience and give them a vantage point to look down on the action of the plays. Actors could make use of the scaffolds or built up mounds of earth at various points and as appropriate to the action of the play. A gateway to control the entrance for the audience and collect the fee from them could be created. Some of the audience, those paying less we assume, could sit on the ground closer to the action, but with more problematic sightlines and less comfort, especially in cold and damp weather. Where there was no such open space available, or the local preference was to hold the festival more centrally, the town market square could be used. But this necessitated more thought about the staging and access control. The plays could be presented on a stage positioned at one end of the marketplace, or in the round from a middle point, or at different locations around the marketplace and indeed in the locality generally. Moving from marketplace to church square and other suitable sites in the town allowed for the processional element of the festival to be maintained, but the logistics of crowd movement and controlling entrances and therefore payment was probably harder and obviously varied considerably by location. And the third style of presentation was by the use of wagons. These formed temporary stages and could be set up in one place for the duration of the festival or moved from site to site within the town for different plays, again retaining both the processional element of the festival and the issue about controlling access. Despite the different staging styles, stage conventions emerged with striking similarity. Most notably, the representation of heaven and hell is consistent. Heaven was positioned on stage right. Hell, or rather the entrance to hell, was positioned stage left. I'll leave any further description of that until next time, as this definitely comes under the topic of special effects, which is the subject of the next episode. The selection of whichever method of presentation was favoured by the organisers was a local decision, and the play scripts could, over time, be adapted to suit the locations. No doubt some started small in front of the church or in another town square and developed into larger festivals that commanded their own space. For some, this became a huge and prestigious operation, where the honour and good standing of the organisers, the guilds and the individuals involved was at stake. Whatever the local situation, some serious rehearsal was required. Once the cast had been selected and parts handed out, rehearsals could begin. As with any cast of amateurs, the first problem is where to fit in the rehearsal around the various day jobs. Whereas we would generally opt for the evening and weekend options, the medieval answer was to rehearse in the morning, before the start of the working day. We know that this is the case from some records of breakfast victuals being purchased for actors. Bread, cheese, bacon and beer. Now, beer may seem like an odd choice for breakfast, but at the time, a brewed beverage was one of the safest ways to take on water. With no public management of clean water, drinking from any source that was unfamiliar could lead to an upset stomach or, much worse, and the brewing process removed the unwelcome bugs and bacteria. We're not talking about a full-on real ale here, but a mildly alcoholic brew that most adults would have drunk on a daily basis, and been very used to. Having said that, there are records of agreements that specify fines and punishments if actors fail to come to rehearsals, come to rehearsals drunk, or get into a dispute with the producer. As ever, these rules are probably there because producers had had a problem with unreliable actors and those over-fond of drink, or at the very least, there was an expectation that such problems were likely. The regularity and intensity of rehearsals again varies from place to place. Some groups started rehearsing soon after Easter, others allowed themselves only a few rehearsals in the month before the first night. That seems quite short and a bit lax to us, maybe, but we should remember that the plays tended not to change a lot year on year, so when the cast was essentially the same every year, it would be a question of refreshing rather than rehearsing from scratch, and only new and updated sections would have to be looked at carefully. The occasional new cast member would probably have worked their way through minor parts or been involved in other ways in the years leading up to when they took over a major role, so they too wouldn't have been completely unfamiliar with the work. 
There's no suggestion that the actors, however amateur and part-time, didn't take their commitment to the production very seriously. In England, where the usual method was to break the scripts into individual plays across the different guilds, the rehearsal time was at its most foreshortened, because the different guilds could rehearse their play or plays individually and then come together for just one or two final rehearsals as a full company. For rehearsal space, whatever was available and presumably free or cheap was used. Church buildings, the chapter house and the private residence of members of the management committee are all mentioned in records. Convenience seems to have been the main driver in the selection of the rehearsal space. And we shouldn't underestimate the need for a technical rehearsal. As the plays expanded over the years, many and varied special effects and types of stage machinery were developed and in some cases became quite sophisticated. I'll return to this subject next time because it's a subject that deserves some time devoted to it, but for the moment I just wanted to recognise that some form of technical rehearsal would have been required and probably also some specific backstage work to queue up and ensure the effects worked as planned. A factor that also helped to reduce rehearsal time was the presence of the pageant master. This role, which in England was known as the ordinary, doesn't really have an equivalent in any other form of theatre that I'm aware of. The role included acting as prompter during the performance, but also as a coach during rehearsal. The closest modern comparison is perhaps the role of the repetiteur in opera and ballet, but the pageant master may also have been a presence on stage. There's a contemporary account from a Cornish play that says, The players know not their parts without book, but are prompted by one called the ordinary who followeth them at their back with the book in hand, and telleth them softly what they must pronounce aloud. So exactly how far did the medieval actor have to learn their parts? Clearly some form of learning was expected as individual parts were copied out by scribes, which at the time was a significant undertaking, not just a question of a photocopier and a highlighter pen, so wouldn't have been undertaken unnecessarily. Yet we seem to have an on-stage prompter whose presence was accepted by the audience and presumably not seen as a distraction. But we do have a bit more evidence. Jean Fouquet was a French painter and miniaturist working in the mid-1400s, and one of his works is a manuscript illustration depicting the play of the martyrdom of Saint Apollonia. The illustration is thought to date from about 1542 and depicts the saint tied to a trestle. She's undergoing torture by having her teeth pulled, and we can see one man holding her tightly by her long, thick hair, and others binding her legs with thick rope, while the torturer pulls on a long string hooked around her tooth. To the right side of the picture, there's a figure in ecclesiastical dress who's holding a prompt book in one hand and a long baton in the other. He could be mistaken for a bishop directing the torture, but other features in the picture tell us that this is an illustration of a saint's play, not a depiction of the original story. In the background, we can see the scaffolding supporting unmistakably theatrical scenery. Some spectators sit in parts of that scenery, and there are devils to the left and angels to the right, an arrangement that conforms to the theatrical conventions of the day. So definitely a representation of the theatre and the character of the ordinary directing the scene on stage is very clear. It's a fascinating picture and I've put a link to it in the show notes and used it in the Twitter and Facebook promotions for this episode so do go and take a look. The play in question is a saint's play and this is a subgenre of the medieval cycle play which we'll get to shortly. So there were rehearsals of varying length and intensity, and possibly prompting and other on-stage assistance from the ordinary, but still, on occasion, not everything went to plan. In 1392, the Smiths Guild of Beverley in Yorkshire were fined 40 shillings because they failed to present their play. And in 1520, from the same cycle, the painters were fined two shillings because their play of the Three Kings was, and I quote, badly and confusedly played before many strangers in contempt of the community. Like I said, this stuff was taken very seriously. The organisers at Valenciennes in France felt it necessary to ask their actors to sign a 15-point contract before they accepted a part. The actor had to commit to performing on specified days, with illness being the only valid reason for not doing so. They had to agree to the parts that they were given without argument, to be punctual in attending rehearsals and to be sober on arrival. On signing the contract, the actor had to pay a deposit of one gold coin, making the breach of any of these rules a more serious matter for them. 
A later contract from Lucerne, Switzerland, commits the actor specifically to abstain from visiting the tavern before rehearsal or performance for the day is complete. For publicity, the organising committee issued proclamations concerning the names of the plays to be presented and the dates and times of performances. These were written on posters and displayed in public places, but also announced by town criers for the benefit of the illiterate. This was done at an early stage, so they also acted as a recruitment tool for those interested in participating. The church was probably the main route for publicity, as it would be appropriate to make announcements about the plays and the feast day generally from the pulpit. The final publicity push was after the dress rehearsal, when typically all concerned, the actors in costume, the craftsmen and the producers processed through town. The aim was certainly to arouse as much enthusiasm as possible and to make sure attendance was going to be good. But it also reminded the townspeople about the devotional nature of the celebration and the implicit obligation for them to attend. And after all that hard work and a lot of organisation and collaboration, we get to the performance. Well. Not quite. First, there was a mass for the feast day. And in later periods, when the cycle spanned several days, a mass to celebrate the start of the festival. The day was full of joy and celebration on a par with Christmas and Easter. But as it happened later in the year, when nature was in the full bloom of spring and early summer, perhaps for many it was the best festival of the year, with the celebrations outside in warm temperatures and usually fine weather. The festival also ended with a church service, and following this, a banquet for those involved and local VIPs. There was an admission charge and different levels of pricing. The best seats could be purchased in advance and inevitably went to those who could afford the comfort. Entrance could also be purchased on the day and was typically for the benches and space on the ground near the acting area that the poorer classes filled. Given the cost of attendance in the cheapest seats was very low, it seems likely that most of the local population did attend. If they were in doubt, there were other incentives. They were already used to the idea that the church feast day had to be taken seriously. These days were only partly for fun and relaxation. The church could threaten eternal punishment and excommunication for misdemeanours such as lewd or violent behaviour or drunkenness on a feast day. If the threat of eternal punishment were the stick, then the carrot was the offer of remission of sins just for attending the plays and maintaining good behaviour. The performance was opened with more prayer, hymn singing or even a full mass, quite likely any combination of the above. Surviving instructions leave the exact process to a decision on the day, presumably dictated by the rowdiness of the crowd. Unfortunately, detailed contemporary descriptions of the plays themselves do not survive. There was no concept of a critical appreciation of the artistic or technical merit of the productions, so we rely on illustrations, the scripts themselves, and the odd description and comment that can be found scattered amongst other works, usually of a clerical nature. There are descriptions recorded in the early 17th century, but these can't be considered entirely reliable as the play cycles had already died out a generation before, and it's unlikely that the descriptions are from eyewitness accounts. The play cycle from Lucerne was revived in the late 16th century and the scripts and some directorial material still exist, but even here the gap in time from the productions of the preceding century means that we can't assume that these are a true representation of the plays as they were performed in earlier times. So it's difficult to be precise about the exact effect that the plays had on the audience and the way that they were received, but we can generalise that it seems unlikely that, as a member of the audience, you could ever forget that this was an extension of your religious duties. The linking of church teachings on the nature of man's relationship to God through Jesus, the prophets and the martyrs was explicit, highly symbolic and probably easily followed by people who were well used to hearing the same message in their frequent attendances in church. Compared to the rigours of the church service, the plays probably were, in many ways, light relief. There is humour in them and quite a lot of spectacle that would impress people who lived simple lives usually within the confines of the town or village that they were born in. And what did the audience make of seeing their fellow townspeople performing in the plays? We're still in a period where only men were permitted to act. In this case, that probably derives from the fact that the original organisers were the male-dominated clergy and that male dominance continued once the plays moved away from the church influence. They were, in reality, never too far removed from that influence. The female parts were played by younger men and, in some cases, male children. 
This was a time when village inhabitants numbered in the tens and town residents numbered in the hundreds. If you lived a typical life in medieval Europe, then you probably knew all the people who lived in your town or village, if not intimately, then at least by sight and family connections and reputation. If you saw your fellow labourer, or the butcher's son, or the blacksmith's apprentice performing in the play, could you be detached enough to get past the actor to the character? It's an impossible question, as is the consideration of if the acting was any good. Given the modern dress for the plays and no expectation for correct historical representation, good or bad acting, as we would understand it, is perhaps not a valid question at all. The actor disappearing into the character was maybe not the point. What we do know is that there were auditions and a casting process, as well as the right of the organisers to impose fines on actors who didn't attend rehearsals or performances. So clearly there was a search not only for commitment, but ability to perform, whatever that exactly meant at the time. Given the large crowds and outdoor setting, they must have had an ear on who could project effectively and give the best chance of the play being heard at all. To conclude today's episode, I'm going to look at the Saints play. Within the development of the Corpus Christi cycle plays, this was a subgenre of plays depicting the life and works of a saint of the church. Many took their lead from the cycle plays that depicted the crucifixion, through a desire to link the suffering and death of the saint in question to that of Christ. If the Corpus Christi cycle brought together the Old Testament prophets, the life and ministry of Christ and the works of the apostles after his death, then the lives of the saints were the logical extension for this. The plays tend to be shorter and simpler than the cycle plays and were associated with more local festivals and particular saints' days. Many are referenced in the European administrative and clerical records, but it's not clear how extensive some were. It's possible that some were just static presentations of scenes from a saint's life in a tableau or a series of tableaus. Some may have been dramatic presentations, but improvised, performed to the reading of a saint's life, or lightly scripted. However, if you take another look at the illustration by Jean Fouquet of the play of the martyrdom of Saint Apollonia, and take in the setting and the costume, it would seem that this was a considerable production, assuming that it is a realistic representation of what the artist saw. Such wide divergence in style and possibly in intent makes generalisations difficult, but we can at least identify the starting point. Back when theatre was in the church, we saw the first saint's play in the form of the Christmas trope and the story of St Nicholas. That places the origin back in the 13th century or earlier and suggests that the saint's play could have developed alongside the Corpus Christi cycle. We have little evidence of pre-14th century saint's plays, but nevertheless, we have to admit this is a possibility. An alternative view that I've seen suggested is that these plays only developed much later, maybe as late as the 1500s, as a means of displaying the horrors of Catholic superstitions and treatment of martyrs. Whatever the case, the plays tend towards the sensational and linger on the cruelties of the torture, balancing this somewhat with an emphasis on the good life of the saint and their reward of a place in heaven. The miracles performed by the saint are also highlighted and it's assumed that the enactment of both the torture and the miracles involved an element of stage business and illusion to make the event at least somewhat realistic. More on that next episode, but for now enough to say that the audience were treated to quite a lot of blood and gore and surprising happenings on the stage. The Saints play is something where we can see a link to the Elizabethan stage, full as it was of witches, devils, spirits, magic happenings, murders and killings in battle. The audiences that went to the early playhouses were well used to seeing blood, gore, killings, torture and miraculous happenings in the cycle plays, and we can assume that early Tudor playwrights saw that this was what appealed and what could put bums on seats. If the evidence left to us is representative, then the Saints play reached the height of popularity in the 16th century, just before the Reformation in England and the Thirty Years' War and Reformation on the continent brought an end to religious epic theatre, as Catholicism became suppressed in large swathes of the continent. Italy and Spain were the exception, thanks to the large retention of the Catholic faith in those areas. The Corpus Christi plays there had already started to stray into the stories of saints and the lives of saints were given equal weight as the ministry of the apostles, so the ground was ripe for the saints' play to be held in equal standing. 
These Spanish and Italian plays were amongst some of the most complex from a staging point of view, requiring multi-levelled stages and scaffolding, where different characters could position themselves amongst and above the audience. We might say an early immersive experience. The record for the most complex play probably goes to the English play of St Mary Magdalene, produced in about 1500. The first part of the play requires 20 changes of location, and the second part has a further 15 locations. There are also Cornish plays from the same time, with similar multiple locations. Notes in the script indicate that it was to be played in the circular earthwork, with the different locations specified with reference to a clock face, hence they're known as the Cornish rounds. Each hour of the clock face indicates a scaffold where certain characters reside. The plays took place over two days, and recurring characters and places like Hell, Emperor Constantine and Bishop Curnow keep their same position for both days, while other characters exchange positions around them. The scope and range of these plays is admirable. The life of the saint is shown from youth to manhood, through whatever tortures he or she met, and on to death and eternal life in heaven. Typically they involve a lot of travelling the world, to places where the names at least would have been familiar to the audience, but probably nothing more to them than an exotic setting for the story. The challenge here was how to show all of this in the confines of the play. Something could be achieved through stage effects, but we know that costuming was minimal, so the representation of foreign and exotic characters was probably rather symbolic. There were suggestions that puppets and models could be used to represent journeys and transports that couldn't be shown realistically, but again, details are sparse. Maybe a journey across the sea could be represented by a model boat being carried by actors using props to represent the sea. That could be amusing for the audience and not out of place in the epic style of narrative, but difficult for us to gauge the true effect. One thing we can say is that the medieval audience would not share our modern scepticism about miraculous acts or the benefits of suffering in this world to gain entrance to the next. This was familiar and accepted stuff for most, if not all, and we can be sure that the audience would be a long way towards the suspension of disbelief long before the play even started. That acceptance becomes even more pronounced when the saint's life in question is your local patron saint, who most people felt a keen affiliation with or if the play was presented in thanksgiving for deliverance from the latest bout of plague or other communal misfortune. Both were common. In fact, through the 15th century, the worship of saints in Europe reached devotional proportions that were rejected in the Reformation and even discouraged by the Catholic Church as they saw it developing into a fetish that bordered on idolatry. By the middle of the 16th century, saints' plays were suppressed almost everywhere in Europe. Now they form little more than a small diversion in medieval theatre, but for a time, maybe quite a long time, they were an important part of the theatrical celebration and were much loved and enjoyed by the people of the time. The production of the play Cycles and Saints plays was a phenomenon that lasted some 300 years and although we may not be able to comment too much on the quality of the acting, we can see that there was a very professional setup around the organisation, promotion and presentation of the plays. That organisation was often undertaken by church or civic leaders, so people who were already leaders in their locality and used to cajoling for participation and organising groups of people to a deadline. They were people who understood the need for financial controls and proper accounting. And it is they who should take a lot of the credit for the survival of the play cycles over a very extended period of time. They were able to employ the best tradesmen and craftsmen to make the Corpus Christi play cycles an event in the life of the people that was so enjoyed it became repeated hundreds of times over hundreds of years throughout Europe. The driving force behind the organisers was the church. And to whatever degree the church stepped back from the practicalities of the productions, it was still their need and beliefs that firstly permitted the productions and then kept them, as far as they were concerned, on track from a doctrinal point of view. The episodic and epic nature of the plays meant that they could be broken down easily into component parts and rehearsed individually. Pulling them together into the complete cycle therefore didn't require the effort that the view of the whole cycle might suggest. Given the repetitive nature of the presentation year on year, sets, scenery, seating, scaffolding, acting parts, props and costumes could all be stored away and reused, keeping efforts in all these areas to a minimum. 
But let's not think that presentation of these plays was an easy task. Surely whatever could be done to ease that burden was done, but this still all required a lot of effort and commitment from many individuals and many organisations. Next time, and as you've already heard, I'm going to take a look at the fascinating subject of stage effects and stage business in the medieval cycle plays. Having escaped from the confines of the church, it didn't take long for the imagination of producers and technicians to work out how they could best represent miraculous happenings, martyrdoms, beheadings, and all sorts of other strange happenings. It is surprising just how ingenious they were, and interesting to consider how the effects were received. In the meantime, please don't forget to take a look at the picture of the martyrdom of St Apollonia on the website, Facebook or on Twitter. And while you're there, please give the podcast a follow or a join on the Facebook group. The Patreon offering has just been updated with a summary of one of the best works on theatre history that I know, The Seven Ages of the Theatre by Richard Southern. And that and all the other extra audios are there for a small monthly fee. Go to patreon.com forward slash T-H-O-E-T-P to find out more. All contributions go towards offsetting the costs of hosting the podcast and are gratefully received. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, comments or concerns, you can always contact me by email on thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Mm-hmm.